Okay, so today I'm going to start by introducing the characteristics of martensite so that we can deal with the crystallography of the transformation from austenite to martensite. But before I go on to martensite, these are the major transformations that happen in steels, and you can divide them into two parts. Uh, these are called uh, reconstructive transformations. That means you take the unit cell, you break all the bonds apart, and you arrange it into another pattern, allowing diffusion to happen so the strain energy is minimized. Okay? And since you allow diffusion to happen, there may also be a chemical composition change during such transformations. The second kind is where you change the crystal structure by a physical deformation. So, for example, if you have a square pattern, you can shear it into an oblique pattern. There's no breaking of bonds, there's no diffusion necessary, and therefore there's also no composition change. So, the theory that we are going to deal with, although it focuses on martensite, covers all of these transformations. So the crystallography of all of these transformations is determined in exactly the same way, okay? Whether it's bainite or Wiedmannstadt and ferrite or martensite. Right, so what we'll do first is identify what you know about martensite. So tell me some facts about martensite. What do you know about martensite? Athermal. What else? Diffusionless. Okay, go on. More. Anything else you know about Martin Side? So you are in GIFT, right? So you should know a great deal about martensite. Sorry? Habit plane. So the martensite forms on specific planes, which are reproduce, reproducible. OK, what else? Volume change. OK, go on. Yep. So I'll put it over here because it's a part of crystallography. Orientation, relation. But of course, you know, for example, allotriomorphic ferrite also can have an orientation relation, but it's not necessarily identical for every ferrite grain. Here, every single martensite plate will have the same variant of the orientation relationship. Okay, what else? Okay, um, Bain distortion, strain, sorry, invariant plane, you said, did you, what did you say, invariant plane, that's the same as a habit plane, okay, really important part missing. So we have a volume change. What else? The key feature of martensitic transmissions. And a shear strain. Okay, what about the properties of martensite? What do you know about the properties of martensite? Brittle. Okay. Anything else? Why is it brittle? Okay. Um, but of course, we can get martensite in low carbon as well, right? Mm -hmm. So why does it tend to be brittle? Carbon makes it brittle, but why does carbon make it brittle? Hmm? Yeah, there's a, a lot of dislocations, uh, sure, but why does that make it brittle? Hmm? 
hardness? Is it hard or soft, Martin said? Okay, so it's very hard. And how do you produce Martin said? Hmm? Quenching, okay. So we quench to produce might inside, okay. Okay, now some of the things that we've written are correct, or some of them are not. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to list the characteristics of might inside uh, as we know it. And by the end of today's lecture, I'm going to leave several questions open. All right? So that means it will seem that we've got accurate experimental data, but they are confusing experimental data. And in the next lecture, you'll see a beautiful theory which solves everything. Okay? Right. So the first thing to note is that Martinside does not have to be hard. Okay? It can be very soft as well in which case it's not brittle. It's the presence of carbon that makes it very hard. Uh, now, why does carbon make martensite hard but not austenite hard? So, you, you know, you can easily have austenite with one weight percent carbon like in twip steel, but it's not hard. Yeah? In fact, the yield strength of twip steel is about 400 megapascals. But if I put the same amount of carbon in martensite, it will be incredibly hard. Why is that? Sorry? Solubility. Uh, okay. Um, how is solubility related to hardness? So we are, we are putting exactly the same amount in martensite as in, and in austenite. So we are comparing the hardness at the same concentration. So why doesn't carbon harden austenite as much as it hardens ferrite? Any ideas? Very good. Excellent. So, in the case of austenite, the octahedral interstice in which carbon sits, okay, so this, this is austenite, this is the face centering atom, okay. The carbon atom sits over here and this distance here is a upon 2 and this distance here is also a upon 2 because it's the center of this face right so it's a uniform expansion caused by carbon so that's a volume change a uniform expansion and the interaction of a uniform expansion with a dislocation is very weak because you know it's a hydrostatic strain and really a dislocation is a shear strain right so the interaction of just a volume change with a dislocation is extremely weak so you get the same effect of carbon as substitutional hardening so if you put a nickel atom in austenite it only causes a volume change and therefore it's a weak hardening effect now if I do the same diagram for ferrite, so I'll just indicate that this is at the face center, okay, here. And this is now at the body center, okay. So it's at a height half in the middle of the cell. Then this distance is a upon 2. What is this distance? Yeah? It, it's in the body center. So it will be root 2 a upon 2. Yeah? So this distance is square root of 2 a upon 2. In other words, half this distance here. Okay? So, that is a long distance, and then we have a very short distance along here. When I insert a carbon atom, it will push the two vertical atoms apart, and the others will move 
towards the carbon atom because there's plenty of space. So that's a tetragonal distortion. Anisotropic distortion interacts very strongly with the strain field of a dislocation. So here we have an anisotropic strain, a tetragonal distortion. And this is the major reason why carbon hardens martensite far more than austenite. Okay? Right, so on this uh, table, you can see that with 0.4 weight percent carbon, I have a hardness of 600, and with 0.2, it's 250. So there's a very large effect of carbon on the hardness. And martensite does not have to be hard. So do you know of martensite in zero carbon iron alloy? Is there any kind of uh, steel uh, where we have um, almost zero carbon, but we produce martensite? So do you know what rocket motor cases are made out of? You've all done military service, I assume, right? Or not? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, so they're made out of something called maraging steel. Uh, Maraging steel has almost zero carbon, but a lot of nickel and molybdenum. When you quench it, it's very soft, something like uh, 200 Vickers hardness. You then heat treat it at 550 degrees centigrade to get nickel moly compound precipitating, which hardens it. But you still have a very tough material, and that's why you can make a rocket motor casing out of it. Okay? So martensite does not have to be hard. Now, MS means the martensite start temperature, the first temperature during cooling at which martensite forms. And you can see that it doesn't have to be low, all right? So in zirconium, for example, uh, you can get martensitic transformation at 1200 degrees Kelvin. In an argon nitrogen solid solution, you can get martensite forming at 30 Kelvin. So the temperature at which form, it forms depends on your material and the driving forces for transformation. Uh, this is interesting, you know. There is no way that you can get diffusion of an iron atom at 4 Kelvin. Yeah? So that confirms, uh, that is one of the things that confirms that the transformation must be diffusionless. You can form it at temperature as low as 4 Kelvin quite rapidly. So that's one piece of evidence for diffusionless transformation. And the other thing to note that martensite doesn't form only in steels. It forms in many materials, but it is of the greatest importance in steels. We use it in hundreds and millions of tons. Whereas, you know, the next major application is the nickel titanium alloys which are used for shape memory which is negligible by comparison. The amount of material you make is negligible by comparison. Everyone happy with this? Okay, so these are a few of the characteristics. I said to you that martensite doesn't necessarily form in steels. Do you know what this is? Virus, okay, and imagine that this is the head of the virus which contains the DNA and these are its arms. What it does, it goes and holds on to a bacterium. All right? And then it operates this hypodermic needle and infects the bacterium with DNA, and that's how it reproduces. So viruses don't mate like human beings or other creatures. They reproduce simply by infecting the bacterium. Yeah? So it's debatable whether you need sex in order to reproduce. So there is a paper um, by David Mackay. You know, the reason for having sex is to get diversity in the population, yeah? So you get mutations and different kinds of things. But you can also get diversity in this process because the process is not perfect, okay? Right, so that was a diversion. What is the mechanism by which this hypodermic needle operates? It's actually a martensitic transformation. 
the cylinder is a two-dimensional crystal. And what happens is that this unit cell changes into this, and that operates the hypodermic needle. And you can see that happening here. So this is our bacterium. It latches onto, uh, uh, sorry, this is our virus. It latches onto a bacterium, and then you get this hypodermic needle operating to inject the bacterium. Now, in the process, of course, this loses its DNA, right? So effectively, it's committing suicide. Yeah, because what is life without DNA, right? Um, now, this, this is uh, meant to be a movie, but I won't show it to you. You can see it on my YouTube channel. Uh, this is your normal shape memory alloy. And, you know, when you cool it, it has a certain shape. When you deform it and warm it up, it will recover the shape, okay? Um, do you know of any applications of shape memory alloys? Hmm? This, sorry, what did you say? <laughs> yeah, like what? What? <laughs> hmm. So you can buy glasses, which are made from shape memory metal. So you know you can do this, and it will come back. Yeah? OK? Um, there's a major application for stents. You know what a stent is? It's a, it's a little tube which holds open an artery which has got deposits on it. Yeah? And you don't need to operate. You know, you can, you can put a, a device through here, and it goes and puts the stent into position. So you can get out of hospital on the same day. And that's made from shape memory metal. Um, the other applications are for space, uh, uh, you know, when you want to open up solar cells in space, you really don't want uh, a complicated mechanism. Shape memory metal does not have any parts in it except the metal, so it unfurls the solar cells and so forth. Okay. So there are, there are important applications, but the quantity of material that we produce is very, very small. Okay, now, how do we know it's a diffusionless transformation? Well, we've already uh, noted that the temperature at which martensite can form can be ridiculously small, right? Diffusion is simply not possible. It does not have to form at a low temperature. You saw that we can even form it at 1200 Kelvin. But in principle, if you can form it at 4 Kelvin, that means there cannot be diffusion, right, within the time scale of the experiment. What other evidence do we have that martensitic transformations are diffusionless? What can you do to prove that martensitic transformations are diffusionless? How would you measure the speed? of the transformation. I'm just going to show you something. I'm not playing with my phone. Yeah, how would you measure the speed of the transformation? What is that? Acoustic emissions coming out from inside the steel when a displacive transformation happens. Can you hear that? Yeah? So every time you get a plate, it causes a ping. And you can show that that, is, that can only happen if the transformation is happening very rapidly. Okay? Um, if you have an Android phone, you can download this application to show to your friends that this is sound coming out from inside the steel. Yeah, and it sounds quite beautiful, actually. If you put it next to your ear, it sounds like a chorus of bells. Similarly, we can measure electrical resistance change very rapidly. 
and from that you can deduce the velocity and it's not far from the speed of sound in the metal. Okay? So speed of sound in iron is about 5000 meters per second. So you can in principle form martensite extremely rapidly. But just like the MS temperature, it does not have to form rapidly. You can actually get martensite forming when you pull the material at a slow rate. You can see the interface moving. But the fact that it can form very rapidly means that diffusion doesn't happen. All right? Now, how can I prove that diffusion doesn't happen? What experimental technique can I use? Which you have in post tech. How can I do chemical analysis to show that diffusion hasn't happened on a very fine scale? What instrument? Don't tell me it's EDAX, yeah? Because you know that the interaction volume of EDAX is quite large. Yeah, for a scanning electron microscope, the beam samples a volume which is, you know, more than a few cubic micrometers. So you can't tell whether the, there is any diffusion over a scale of one atom. How, what is the instrument that you would use for atomic resolution of chemistry? Yeah, I, I think you have the answer. You just have to say it loudly so that I can hear. Yeah? You've seen many, many images, actually, in the seminars. Atom probe? Have you heard of the atom probe? Yeah. Which is in the nano center here where you can, you know, pick out atoms one by one, measure the time of flight, and therefore you know what the species is, and form a three-dimensional image. So you can do experiments which show that on the finest conceivable scale, so you can't get chemical analysis finer than atom, right? On the finest conceivable scale, there is no diffusion during martensitic transmission. Right, so here we are. We can form it at low temperatures. We don't have to form it at low temperatures. It can grow very rapidly, although it can also grow slowly. And there is no composition change. You can use many kinds of instruments to prove that. Now, you've already said that for martensite, there's a habit plane, right? That means a crystallographic plane on which it precipitates and that is reproducible. What is the shape of martensite in three dimensions? Any ideas? What would that look like in three dimensions? This is obviously a two-dimensional section, right? What would martensite look like in three dimensions? Yeah? Yeah, you're, you're, you're doing the right movements, yeah? So, that's a plate, right? Yeah. Why isn't it a needle? Because these look like needles. Needle is like this, yeah? So. Why can I conclude that it's not a needle? So many people loosely say these are martensite needles, right? Why is that wrong? So, you know, if you're looking at a random section, if it's a needle, you'll see many small ellipses. You don't see that. You always see sections like this. The probability of actually seeing a section like that, if it's a needle, is very, very small. Okay? So there's no doubt at all that in three dimensions it's a plate, and you can easily prove that by doing a two-surface analysis. So you polish this surface, this surface, and you can see the plate going across that. 
And that's of course consistent with the fact that we, it forms in a specific plane, not a specific direction. Now, if I take a single crystal of austenite and I, it's just surrounded by air, then when it transforms, I get a displacement, which is very large. It's a shear deformation on the habit plane. Okay? And there may also be a volume change. But if it is surrounded by other crystals of austenite, then it's pushing against them, right? then it cannot form a shape like that because that would cause too much strain energy. It adopts a lenticular shape, that means a lens-like shape in which the tip is very sharp. And I'll explain the reason why it adopts that shape later when we work out the strain energy per unit volume. The thin plate shape minimizes the strain energy per unit volume because this change in shape is very large. Yeah, and remember, it's pushing against everything, and therefore it has to form as a plate. So mechanical twins, for example, if you look at the twip steels, TWIP, yeah, are extremely sharp. Or uh, if somebody is working on magnesium alloys, and you see the twins, they will be extremely sharp. If you compare with annealing twins, completely different shape, you know, which is not determined by strain energy, because that's not a deformation, that's simply a grain which happens to be in a twin orientation. Okay? Now, um, the habit plane, okay, so here are some habit plane indices in different uh, materials. And I've labeled this as approximate because you cannot actually express the habit plane in terms of integers. In reality, it's irrational. That means, you know, it's not one one one, but it's something close to one one one. So, can you tell me an irrational number? Have you got an example of an irrational number? Yeah. Pi uh, one over root two, yeah, or, or root two. It goes on forever, right? You can't express that as an integer. So sometimes we write pi as twenty two over seven, but that's just an approximation, right? Similarly, these habit plane indices are not accurate. They're approximate values. And they're also very strange, right? So 1, 1, 1, you're very familiar with. It's a close back plane, and you might expect something like that, okay? But it's not exactly 1, 1, 1. But why do we have something really strange like 2, 9, 5, and 3, 15, 10, and 2, 5, 2? Yeah? So we have to answer those questions, but not today. This is very confusing. First of all, it's not an exact plane like in slip. In slip, you know, you, uh, in FCC, it happens on one 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 plane exactly, and in the one one zero direction on that plane exactly. That isn't the case with Martinsite. It forms on irrational planes. And you know, even if the compositions are not all that different, yeah like this is 28 nickel and this is 30 nickel 0.3 carbon, the habit planes are totally different. So whatever theory there is has to be able to explain this. Similarly, everybody talks about the kojumov sachs and nishiyama Wasserman orientations, right? So ba basically though, that means that the closed back planes in the two structures are parallel or approximately parallel. and the closed back directions in those two structures are parallel. But actually those orientations don't exist. When you measure accurately, you will find that the closed back planes are not parallel. They, they are deviated by something like 0 0.52 degrees. And similarly, the directions are not exactly parallel. The orientation relationships themselves are irrational. When we talk about Kojumov, Sachs, and Nishiyama Vasman, those are just approximations. And another mistake is that, you know, um, people say Kojumov, Sachs has 24 variants and Nishiyama Vasman has 12 variants, right? But if it's irrational, then everything has 24 variants, okay? Right, so we need to explain why we have an irrational orientation relationship and we should be able to predict that. Uh, this is just how 
these orientations are written that the closed packed plane in austenite is parallel to the most closely packed plane in the ferrite and the closed packed directions are parallel exactly in Kojum of Sachs which doesn't exist okay and similarly for Nishiyama Vasaman there are other possibilities now we mentioned that the transformation is athermal what does athermal mean well if I am forming perlite and I hold my austenite at this temperature then I'll see the progression of transformation as a function of time first I get 1% and then it evolves towards 100% right the time is on the horizontal axis that isn't the case with martensite if I cool to this temperature I will only get 1% I have to cool further in order to get 50% and this is the equation which expresses the volume fraction of martensite as a function of undercooling below MS there's no time term in there right? so there's very little thermal activation needed to form martensite but in fact uh, this, this observation is only true when the martensite forms rapidly yeah. so it forms so rapidly that we can't monitor the evolution of volume fraction but if we could do that then you would see a time dependence it's just a very very fast reaction okay right um, in the last lecture we looked at how to create an interface we took a single crystal we sliced it in half and then tilted the two halves with respect to one another and we found that there is a gap and that gap we filled up by putting extra half planes which are basically dislocations right? and the spacing between the dislocations becomes smaller as the misorientation theta becomes larger so the structure of the interface really does consist of an array of dislocations which you can observe in a transmission electron microscope but there are two kinds of arrays uh, this is what we call a glissile interface that means if I apply a force then the interface will glide it doesn't need any diffusion yeah? you can see that this is just like a slip dislocation except it's not a slip dislocation it will transform the structure so it's like a partial dislocation yeah? so can you give me an example of a partial dislocation so when it moves it changes the structure Hmm? twinning doesn't change the structure it changes the orientation yeah? Hmm? yeah is there a name for the partial a Shockley partial have you heard of that yeah so the Burgers vector is not a lattice vector so these dislocations can glide and when they glide they change the shape from this side to this side Right. there's no diffusion necessary the Burgers vector is not in the plane of the interface okay in contrast to move this interface I need to have climb okay you've heard of climb of dislocations right so that means if we have an extra half plane here I've got to remove a row of atoms by diffusion before the interface moves so we cannot have this kind of an interface in martensitic transformations we must have a glissile interface so if one structure is to transform into another structure by a martensitic mechanism then we must be able to create a glissile interface that's a fundamental requirement for martensitic transformation now do you know what a jog is yeah what is it what is a jog Go and explain what a jog is. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, you know what it is. Okay, so let's imagine we have uh, two dislocations. This is a screw dislocation because the Burgers vector is parallel to the line vector, and this is not, right? When this dislocation cuts this one, it will leave a step which is parallel to B1. Okay, so 
the screw dislocation will acquire this step which is parallel to B1 and of course this dislocation will cut this one when they cross and therefore I will get a step on this which is parallel to B2 now, simply because the line orientation has changed, the Burgers vector hasn't, because the Burgers vector must be constant along the dislocation, right? So, this is, uh, sorry, this is no longer a screw. It's an edge component, because the Burgers vector is not parallel to the line vector. And therefore, it won't be able to glide like a screw dislocation. It will become sessile. Okay? So, the point I'm trying to make is that in order for the interface to be glissile, I must only have a single array of dislocations, not crossing dislocations. Yeah, in the last lecture, I mentioned that we created the bicrystal by tilting, but you can tilt about three different axes, right? And therefore, you can get more than one array of dislocations. That would not be good for Martensite because these dislocations would interfere and create sessile components. So a very important conclusion is that in the glissile interface, we must have only one set of dislocations. Interface. Sorry, this marker is no good. Only one set of dislocations. Now, if I have just one set of dislocations and I look at the interface on the plan view, then it will look something like this. Okay, so these are the dislocations. Okay. There's no crossing dislocations, right? So, the conclusion is you cannot have any misfit along this direction. Because if you have misfit along this direction, then you will need other dislocations to accommodate this misfit, right? So that means we must be able to find one completely coherent line between the parent and product lattices. If you cannot find a completely coherent line between the two lattices, it's impossible to get martensitic transformation. Right? We call that line an invariant line. So we must have coherency along this line, must have coherency along this line, and this line is called an invariant line. It gives you the fundamental condition whether one material can transform into another structure by martensitic mechanism. If you cannot find a single line which is coherent between the two structures, martensitic transformation is impossible. Okay. So if somebody told you, look, uh, I want to know whether you know aluminum oxide can transform from a cubic structure to a tetragonal structure by martensitic mechanism, if you cannot find a line which is coherent between the two, then it's impossible. It still may not happen if the driving forces are not there, yeah? if the stability uh, of the tetragonal form is you know, um, not right to give you a negative change in free energy. But if you cannot find a coherent line, it's not possible at all. Right, so this is an important result. Uh, a glissile interface, first of all, cannot contain more than one set of dislocations because they will interfere with each other, produce jog, and the interface will become sessile. And martensite is only possible if the deformation which changes the parent into the product leaves one line undistorted and unrotated. That means coherent. Okay? Undistorted means it hasn't changed its length from the, between the two structures and unrotated, of course, uh, you know, it's like a twist boundary, yeah? So the deformation which changes the parent into the product is what we call an invariant line strain. Okay. 
So that deformation leaves one line completely unchanged. Okay? Now, we also have something known as an invariant plane strain in which a plane is left completely undistorted and unrotated. So an invariant line is a subset of an invariant plane because an invariant plane has an infinite number of invariant lines. Right? Okay. So if you can find a, a deformation which is an invariant plane strain, that's consistent with Martin Siddick transformation. Everyone happy with this? Right, so that, that's just showing the diagram which I drew on the board that there cannot be distortion along this line, otherwise we need another set of dislocations to accommodate that strain. And this is the reason why the interfacial energy between martensite and austenite is very small. Yeah, this is a typical value, 0 0.2 joules per meter squared, which compares with a twin boundary. Okay, twin boundary doesn't have a change in crystal structure. An incoherent boundary would be about four times greater. And, you know, if you look at the surface energy of window glass, it's about one joule per meter squared. So there's a great deal of coherency in the interface between martensite and austenite because that's a necessary condition for a glissile interface. Right, um, this is an image produced using Nomaski interference contrast where we have a sample of austenite which is polished completely flat. It's then allowed to transform into martensite and there's no etching but the transformation produces a shape change. That means the height of the surface changes and interference colors appear using this technique in optical microscopy. So this is a completely unetched sample and you can see that the surface has been tilted. With each martensite plate, you've got a tilt of the surface, right? And that's the shape deformation of martensite. And if we accurately measure that, then it is as follows, right? So imagine that you have a crystal of beryllium, and I pull it. Then in beryllium, the Poisson's ratio is zero. So the volume change is only along one direction. Okay? So this plane is unaltered by the strain. Then if I slip a crystal, then it's a pure shear, isn't it? So again, this plane is unchanged, and this is my shear deformation. This is what happens with martensite. It's a combination of a uniaxial dilatation and a shear. Okay? So the volume change does not influence this plane. It happens normal to that plane. It's not an isotropic volume change. Okay. So there's a plane here, when I measure that shape deformation, which is undistorted and unrotated. And look at the magnitudes of the strains here. A typical elastic strain, say, say the modulus of steel, let's say it's 200 gigapascals. And if I apply a stress of 200 megapascals, then the strain is 10 to the minus 3. This is 0 0.26. It's a huge deformation. Okay. And if that is happening in the bulk of material, then you will get a very large strain energy term. And that dominates everything about the transformation. Now, here I've drawn this uh, with smooth lines, but if you look at a very high resolution, of course, this is a crystal. So you don't get smooth lines, but you will get the, these steps at the interface. And I'll come back to those steps later. But when we look at a macroscopic scale, uh, we see a smooth deformation. Okay. Right. Now, if I have a stress-strain curve, which is elastic, stress, strain, then it will simply be a straight line, right? Yeah, what is the strain energy per unit volume? So if I stress it to this 
What is the strain energy that's stored inside the material? Area under the curve, which is uh, this term here. Yeah? So it's half sigma epsilon, right? Now I can replace sigma by modulus times strain. So that is half the modulus times strain squared. Yeah. So if you look at this equation, which is the strain energy per unit volume, then I've got modulus times strain squared. So it's very easy to understand this part of the equation. But actually the theory for working out the strain energy for a plate is far more complicated than what I've drawn on the board. We have to use what's known as Ashelby theory to work it out. And that's too complicated. So what I'm going to show you is how we get this term here, which is the thickness over the length. Right? So imagine then, So we've got our shape here, which is austenite, and this distance here is 1. And if I transform it into martensite, then I get a combination of shear and volume change. So this is delta, and this is S. And the shear strain is simply the displacement divided by the height, right? So, you know, if I take, for example, this position here, then the shear strain is exactly the same as this position here, because it's this displacement divided by the height, right? However, this displacement is what is pushing against everything, right? And the displacement becomes smaller and smaller as I get closer to the habit plane. So if I make my object as a thin plate, then the displacement at the tip is zero, right? So basically that minimizes the strain energy. We are minimizing the displacements. The strain is still the same, but we are minimizing the displacements, the pushing against the surrounding material. And that's where this term, physical origin of this term thickness over length, comes. Is everyone happy with that? If I make my plate fatter, then the displacements are larger. Okay? Everyone happy with that? So, whenever we have a shape deformation like the one we described, you will always get a thin plate. And that's true of bainite, it's true of Wiedmann-Staden ferrite as well. All of them have the same kind of crystallography. Okay, so let me just summarize uh, the problems we've had. Uh, first of all, we haven't explained at all the strange habit planes like 3, 10, 15 and irrationality, nor have we explained the strange orientation. And we note that the shape deformation is one which leaves a plane unchanged, an invariant plane strain. So that's consistent with Martin Siddick transformation. But I'm going to show you that there's, it's impossible to change austenite into ferrite by a shear. It's impossible to do that. But that is what we observe. Okay? Experimentally, that is what we observe. But it, if I carry out the operation, you will see it's impossible. Okay, so here we have the unit cells of austenite and ferrite. And if I draw two unit cells of austenite next to each other, face-centered cubic, I can identify a cell which is body-centered tetragonal, which is still austenite. We haven't done anything, we've just redrawn the pattern into a different shape. But what that does, it, it tells me how to get cubic by just a deformation. If I compress along this axis and expand uniformly along those two axes, I get a cube. And that's called the Bain strain. 
which changes the FCC structure into a BCC structure. Okay? So let's see if we can find for this deformation the uh, invariant line, which is essential for mitensitic transformation. Okay? Right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to represent the austenite as a sphere. So the yellow is a sphere. And this is the z direction, this is the x direction, uh, and the y direction is going out of the plane of the board. So when the Bain strain operates, I compress along the z axis. So the sphere becomes an ellipsoid of revolution. Right? So here is our ellipsoid. And you can see there are two lines here, OA dashed and OB dashed, uh, sorry, OA and OB, which become OA dashed and OB dashed and they are not changed in length. Are those invariant lines? Can I call OA and OB invariant lines because they are not changed in length? No, why? You're right, but why? Yeah, they are rotated. And I cannot find any lines from the Bain strain which are undistorted and unrotated. So the Bain strain cannot be the complete story. Yeah? There's no invariant line. Now if I take my ellipsoid and I add a rigid body rotation, then I can bring one line into coincidence. Okay? And that would become an invariant line, but not the other one. So the combination of Bain strain and rigid body rotation actually gives you an invariant line. All right? And the rotation that I need to create that invariant line exactly predicts the orientation relationship. Okay? Because if I go back uh, to the Bain strain, this is not the orientation relationship that we observe. That means the z-axis of ferrite is not parallel to the z-axis of austenite and so on. And the x-axis is not parallel to a 110 direction. But if I add that rigid body rotation which is required to create the invariant line, you can exactly predict the observed orientations. All you need is the lattice parameters of the two structures and you can exactly predict the orientation and it will be irrational. Okay? So we've solved one problem. But you saw in that diagram that I can only produce one invariant line. I cannot produce two. There's no rotation I can operate which will produce two invariant lines. Right? If I can produce two, that's a plane. So this is inconsistent with the shape change that we observe, which looks like a shear on an invariant plane with very accurate measurements. So we still have the inconsistency that the Bain strain and rigid body rotation only produces one invariant line, but the shape deformation that we see looks like an invariant plane strain. Okay. So we'll solve that in the next lecture. Okay.